Hello everybody, myself Dr. Vishal Sharma, Assistant Professor, Government MM College, Jammu. Presently, I am Fulbright Climate Fellow, United States of America. Today's my, my presentation is about solar cells. And uh, in this presentation, I will tell about my journey from organic to hybrid perovskite solar cells. <clears throat> First of all, what is the, uh, I will tell you what is the motivation behind my work. And then I will tell you the basis of conventional solar photovoltaics, their limitations. And then I will goes to, go to organic solar cell, then perovskite solar cell, and then some conclusions and future scopes for young researchers. What are the future scope in solar cells? No, first of all, what is the motivation behind my, my research? you know conventional energy resources how much they left for example let's talk of oil you know uh, what are the conventional energy resources we are using nowadays this is oil natural gas coal even nuclear we are using now what is the average age of uh, all these uh, natural resources for example uh, let's take example of oil it's i think it lasts for only 125 years what is the fate of this uh, natural gas? Uh, it also lasts for only 210 years. Then coal is 300 years and nuclear is also 300 to 400 years. So moreover, the continuous use of conventional energy sources like uh, I'm talking about is also the leading cause of pollution. And you know, a lot of people are not talking about climate change and how to, because you know, energy, we, we need energy day by day and the demand of energy is increasing day by day. So we need some sort of, uh, you know, green sources of energy for, for fulfilling the demands of the future generation. Now, let's talk about the humanity's top 10 problem for the next 50 years. And you, you can see from here, the, the top most problem is your energy. This is the top in the list of problems. Of course, there are other problems like water, food, environment, poverty, terrorism, etc. But the, but the most important problem is energy. You know, I think future wars are not for boundaries, they are for few, uh, uh, green energy and water. So I think this is the most important to, to talk about energy nowadays. Now, uh, you can see that uh, as, as our technology is advancing day by day, we require more and more energy. And uh, we cannot curtail the demand of energy because then, then it hinders the sustainable development. So uh, what we can do, we, we have to search for some other alternative of energy uh, and, and, and that too green energy because, you know, fourth is the important one is the environment also. We have to save environment also. So green energy, it's not energy only, it's a green energy we can, we can say. So we, we we have to search some other alternatives of energy and that to the green sources of energy. So I think, and uh, if you talk of some green resources of energy or conventional or, or renewable energy uh, sources of energy, and there are, there are the list in the, in the list, there are different, different sources like uh, solar energy, like wind energy, then offshore wind energy, then tidal energy, then uh, of course, thermal energy, there are a lot of uh, geothermal energy, sorry, there are a lot of, lot of uh, renewable energy resources, but, but my point is, uh, we need some, some sustainable energy and that to green energy. And, uh, uh, of course, in my view, that, that sustainable source of energy is only solar energy. So, we have to do research on solar energy and how we use, utilize this solar energy in day-to-day -day life. Why I'm talking of only solar energy? Let's, why solar energy? Enough solar energy hits the surface of the earth in one hour to satisfy humanity's energy demand for the entire year. So, and also, I also want to quote uh, the famous quotation by Thomas Edison. I had put my money on sun and solar energy. What a source of power. I hope we do not have to wait until oil and coal run away before we tackle this problem. So he, this scientist has a vision long ago about solar. So, and he's the, you know, inventor of uh, electric bulb. He has done a lot of the research in electricity, but he has still hope in solar energy. He knows in future we need solar energy. So 
that's why solar energy is very very important it's abundance everywhere it and if we utilize it in the right way we can we can solve the energy problem in the world now what is solar cell a solar cell is a photovoltaic cell it's it's a device which convert sun's energy directly into electricity and the process is known as photovoltaic effect uh, you know when uh, for for young researchers or young students when sunlight falls on, the, on, uh, on some materials, it converts that sunlight into electricity. And the processes of converting sunlight into electricity is known as photovoltaic effect. And that device which converts it is known as solar cell. Now, there are a lot of technologies in solar photovoltaic. And uh, I, would, I would categorize these technologies into inorganic solar cell, organic solar cell, and hybrid solar cells. What are the inorganic? They use some inorganic materials like gallium arsenide, silicon, etc., to make solar devices. And uh, you know, nowadays these technologies are very much used, and uh, approximately 80% of the market in the world is captured by this inorganic solar cells. But they have some limitations, and that limitation is overcome by some sort of organic materials. But at the same time, uh, organic materials also some limitations. And that is overcome by this hybrid technology that is a novice technology, but it has the advantages of both inorganic and organic materials. So in hybrid, there are two, this disynthesized solar cells and perovskite. I'm, I'm, I focused on my research and perovskite. This is a very new technology, but it's a huge you know, efficiency surge in this technology. So uh, I think perovskite is the best suitable technology for uh, and it will replace this inorganic technology in future i am sure about that and feel confident about that so now uh, let's take a look at this table and uh, these are some inorganic material like silicon gallium arsenide uh, i'll have a dot of 2005 and 2020 you, know, you can see from here in silicon the silicon efficiency of silicon in 2005 is 25 percent in 2020 after research of 15 years it's only 26 percent so it's a very small rise in efficiency you know uh, and you can say that the silicon has saturated its efficiency level let's take a further you know uh, and and the silicon is the most you know uh, the silicon technology solar cells have uh, uh, over you know uh, have captured the market in the world uh, you know, you have seen so many solar panels and they're all silicon, maybe of single crystal or multi crystalline, but they're of silicon, most of them. Now, there are some emerging technologies are organic solar cell, quantum dot solar cell, and perovskite solar cell. You can see now again, it's 5% in 2005 and rises to 17%, huge rise. But if you talk of perovskite solar cell, you can see it's only 2010, we have efficiency of 3%. But now we have efficiency of 24% and that is very comparable, even more than that of silicon devices. So this technology has a very good scope in future and uh, we should work on that. And you know, within a span of only 10 years, we have a lot, a huge surge in the efficiency. So I think we should work on this technology and this technology will surely overcome silicon one day. We, we, have, a, we have full confidence in that. Now, what are the limitations we of conventional solar cell? Let's talk of that. And uh, I think it's a high cost. Why it's high cost? Even because you know, for silicon, it's a silicon is not uh, when it's when it's uh, when it's in open atmosphere when it reacts with the oxygen. You know, it's it's it converted to silicon dioxide. Silicon plus oxygen goes to silicon dioxide, and silicon dioxide is an insulator. So you have to be you have to make them in a sophisticated clean rooms you have to fabricate the solar cells and uh, in my view you cannot fulfill the demand of entire world by making solar cells in small sophisticated and costly clean rooms so we have to replace the, this technology otherwise uh, there's a big problem energy problem in the world 
Second is large area. We cannot make sil silicon solar cells in a large area because of a lot of many reasons like uh, less flexible. They are not flexible. We need flexibility in solar cells because if you want to coat, if you want a solar car, you have to coat that car uh, and uh, that, to coating that car, you need flexible devices, flexible solar cells. You need, you need, if you want to make curtains out of that, you need flexible devices. So silicon is not flexible. So this is a limitation, big limitation. Complicated processing steps. That's why, yeah, have, uh, of course, they have a very complicated uh, steps, fabrication steps, and uh, not available in different colors. Why? Why we need different colors? Because if you want to coat, suppose, uh, for example, let's for example, if you coat your car with a solar, uh, you want to call car with a solar panel. You need different different colors for that. Somebody, somebody like green color. Somebody likes red color. You know. So it's not available. Silicon is not available in different colors. So you need different. You want to coat your window pans with solar panels. So what you require, you need required different colors for that. So I think uh, this is also a, a limitation, not suitable for space application. This is very important reason because I'm here working on uh, on, on solar uh, panels, which, which may be used uh, by NASA in, in and space stations, which NASA is going to establish in 2025. So actually what we need, we need flexible devices, lightweight flexible solar devices for, for going to space. You know, if you want to uh, establish space station there, you need very lightweight devices there. So silicon is not, silicon is not lightweight, not flexible. So uh, if we made some, some, uh, some solar cells, some solar panels with the help of flexible and lightweight devices, they can directly go into space and that is the beauty of uh, perovskite solar cells I will, I will talk of it in the later part of my presentation so the, all these limitations can be overcome by maybe by uh, organic or maybe by perovskite solar cells now first of all i will talk about organic solar cells they are third generation solar cells and uh, they are made of organic materials and they are on different types single layer bilayer and bulk heterojunction and we'll talk about uh, bulk heterojunction why it's important we'll talk in later part of the presentation now this is the basic structure of organic solar cell it taken it is it's taken from uh, directly from the silicon uh, basic structure like you have a active layer of organic material embedded in two electrodes this is itur metal and this is aluminium you can take it uh, like uh, uh, gold or magnesium or any other metal okay so between the two metals a organic material is embedded and when light bring on this uh, organic materials uh, electron hole pair are generated and due to the potential difference electrostatic potential difference between the two electrodes they are uh, you know uh, diverted uh, towards the two electrodes and uh, you will collect it when you put a buyer wire between the two electrodes and how and this is how a, uh, your sun's electricity sun's sun's radiations are converted into electric very simple uh, example of this but the efficiency of the, this device is very very less why it's less because in organic material when you bring light on that electrically electron will appear are generated but in organic materials when you bring light on that excitons are generated what are excitons they are basically bound electron hole pair they are not free they are bound electron hole pair and you have to dissociate this bound electron hole pair although the force is very less but you need an external force to dissociate it and that external force is is provided by this the difference of electrostatic potential between the, these two electrons but the efficiency is very less so and this is you know uh, this is the work function difference between the two electrodes and there's a band bending uh, of the and due to this band bending the electron hole pair there's a excitone is dissociated and you will get some some current at the outer but the efficiency is very very low how to improve the efficiency we have to we have to take some means to dissociate it very easily so what they have done they will again take uh, the architecture from pn junction solar cell pn junction silicon solar cell so so one side is a donor and other side is the acceptor materials pn and then 
even then the you know uh, the efficiency is very less because uh, it's all depend upon the diffusion length of the excitone also at the edge it is dissociated but at the bulk of the material they are again combined because diffusion length is not uh, you know this if this l the diffusion length should be greater than l only then you will get a collector efficiency and higher efficiency of the cells but again this is a problem for that because diffusion length is uh, not very up to the mark to get all the electron hole pair which are generated at this junction to collect at the electrode so we have to think in a different manner and the and now comes to the bulk heterojunction solar cell what is that in this bulk heterojunction we we'll mix two materials one donor and one acceptor and and there are the beauty of this uh, structure is that we have junctions everywhere you can see from here this is a this red part is another material and this uh, whitish part is another material and there's a junction everywhere when light impairing a lot of electron hole pairs are generated and they are dissociated at the at the junction and and then they start their journey towards their respective electrodes and you know from here the diffusion length is very very less sorry the diffusion distance is very very less and you have a more efficiency more collector efficiency from this and hence you will get a very high efficiency by this bulk heterojunction solar cells now this is a basic architecture of bulk heterojunction solar cell you have a glass substrate on that glass structure you have ito for an anode and then p dot pss this is the whole transport layer it it helps in the in the collection of holes and uh, this is a actual donor acceptor blend material this is for use for light absorption and this is active layer you can say and this is a cathode made up of aluminium or gold now what are the effects factors which affects the solar cell efficiency there are a lot of many factors first of all thickness of the layer then solvent then concentration of donor and acceptor polymers then ratio how much how how, how much is the ratio of donor acceptor uh, molecules then annealing temperature what a temperature what temperature you are annealing at and then annealing time how much time you are annealing the device the, all this uh, if you want to have a good solar cell with, uh, with a higher efficiency you have to control you have to optimize all these parameters only then you have a like you have to optimize the thickness you have to optimize the solvent you have to optimize the concentration the ratio annealing temperature annealing time and then you will be able to get good uh, solar cell now what are the electrical parameters you will you know you will measure in your device what is called short circuit current this is your short circuit current if you see there are four quadrants this fourth quadrant when the graph is at the fourth quadrant only then you will get gain power from the device so uh, when this fourth quadrant connect here this point is called jsc this is called short circuit current this is called voc this is called open circuit current oh sorry open circuit voltage and this part is called fill factor and uh, when you talk about all these things you will get a convergent efficiency and that is best part of the solar cell how much efficiency you are getting and efficiency means how much of electricity converted to electron hole pair and the, and and that is called efficiency so you need more and more efficiency for the devices these are different formulas by which you will um, get the values of fill factor power or convert efficiency and all that now what are the general procedure for making solar very important for younger researchers who want to go in this field who want to adopt this field so i'll tell you very uh, this is a flow chart of the uh, of, of the process and this is applicable to every whether you are working on perovskite whether you are working on organic or inorganic this is valid for every device so first of all you have to synthesize the material whether it's organic inorganic or perovskite you have to synthesize it or you have to purchase it from the market so you have to synthesize the material and then you have to uh, take some organic solvent and then dissolve the material in that organic solvent that must be suitable organic solvent you have to see that for different materials different organic solvents are available and then at, uh, at the same time you have to take substrate of ito or fto then on that substrate we do some etching and to make uh, the particular so, uh, area of the solar cell and then some sort of standard cleaning processes are there by which you can you can uh, you can do cleaning of the substrate and then 
this, these all processes are done at room temperature because if you if you done it in the sophisticated clean clean rooms, then only the same problem. The cost of the solar cell is increasing. So all of these processes you have to do in a very uh, you have an ambient atmosphere so that we can we can uh, cut the cost of the solar cells also. So that is very important. Then you have to do thin film deposition by spin coating. That's a very simple process. You do some to take a spin coater and then you spin uh, coating the layer, thin film layer on that. Then you do some sort of characterization on that film, thin film. You want to to know some physical properties uh, or to know some physics behind that. And then uh, at that uh, thin films, you do some uh, electro deposition and that is done by thermal evaporation method, sorry. And then you will get a device sort of that and do some sort of, you know, electrical, you, you may have some electrical parameters like uh, what is the VOC of that, GSC, uh, open circuit voltage, um, short circuit current fill factor, and finally the efficiency of the device. So this is the whole process. How much is the time? Five minutes, no problem. Now, uh, now we have. Now this is the you know character different characterization techniques you can use uh, UV visible. Uh, you, you can find the band gap of the material photoluminescence. Also from there you can find the band gap and you you compare the band gap of PL with UV. Then XRD you have to do because you have to see the whether it's a crystalline or not, then you have to do some AFM morphology measurements, FSM, then impedance spectroscopy to see how conducting the layer is and some sort of current voltage measurements. This is all, and you can do more for, if you want to know the physics behind that, you can do many more, but these are the basic characterization techniques that you know and you have to do that. Now, what else? now uh, I started with a very famous PCHT PCBM bulk heterojunction organic cell. A lot of people has done a lot of research on this uh, solar cell PCHT PCBM. Here, PCHT is a donor and PCBM the acceptor. So, uh, this PCBM, this uh, here, this is called fullerene derivative, and P61 is the most popular one used in organic solar devices. So I started with this uh, material and uh, then I've changed this material, replaced this material with other material and see what happened. So uh, this is a solar cell. So PCHT PCBM I have made in the first go. This is a solar cell. You can see this is aluminum. Uh, this is ITO, different layers. And this is the architecture of the organic solar cell. And you know, this is the actual device and this is the architecture you can see from here. And the overlapping area is the area of solar cell. No experimental. Data. First of all, etching, then cleaning. There are different cleaning processes, oxygen plasma treatment for five minutes, then uh, P dot PSS layer, thin layer, 2000 RPM for one minute. These are all optimized parameters. And uh, then 100 degrees centigrade for 20 minutes, sample are annealed. And finally, aluminum is uh, thermally evaporated on the electrodes. Very simple steps were very effective steps. And they're all, you have to optimize these uh, steps for a good efficiency solar cell. And this is the energy band diagram. Very important, uh, this is why it's important because, you know, uh, the VOC of the material depend upon this difference, homo lumo difference of donor acceptor. If this energy difference, energy gap is more, you will get more VOC. If energy difference is less, you will get less VOC. There are different, different advantages of more VOC and love. If, if your open circuit voltage is more, you will get higher efficiency solar cell. That is basic formula. And if you are, if you are able to replace this material or this material with, with uh, with some material that increases the gap between homo lumo levels, you will get more VOC. And if you're getting more VOC, you will get higher efficiency. This is the basic funda of replacing materials. So if you want to replace different, different materials, you have to understand the energy band diagram of these materials. Now, this is some sort of uh, theoretical calculations, how this homo lumo levels are uh, related to VOC of that material. And for P3HT, the highest value is, theoretical value is one volt. 
but it's difficult to achieve because of different different reasons because of the you know impurities and uh, some tail uh, some other uh, reasons for that such as disordered induced tail states homologous level and level interfacial states and all that this is all due to uh, you know defects and uh, it, it it will decrease your voc from actual practical value to a practical value so this is iv character 6 actual iv character of actual device which i have fabricated you can see that this point gives you the value of jsc this point gives you the value of voc and this area if you calculate this area this will give you the value of fill factor and when you put all this value we get the efficiency of the device so this is my first device and uh, very less efficiency of course but but this is my first device with pcht pcvm and which this material is most popularly used uh, in organic solar cells now what i have done i want to replace this p61 with p71 why i'm i want to replace it because it has a desired energy levels desired energy level means it will increase your you know the gap between homolomal levels and it will enhance your voc and ultimately your efficiency then comes to it it has high electron mobility when it's a high electron mobility it also depend it also increase your efficiency because mobility is high means more electron hair pair you can extract from the device good solubility in most organic solvents so solubility is again very important and it it, it the material should be soluble in most of the organic solvents so, should, so that you can play with different different organic solvents so you understand so as i already told you that organic solvents has effect on the solar uh, photovoltaic parameters so uh, good solubility in most of the organic solvents so i have chosen i have i wanted to replace this with p61 but and when i replaced you can see that when i replaced and i i have made thin films and you can see this blue part and this red part this is with 61 this is with 71 and i found that with 71 we have a enhanced absorption spectra and uh, you know when you enhance the absorption spectra you will increase the absorption uh, this spectra will be increased you will absorb more energy so p71 the organic solar cell be p70 will absorb more uh, photovoltaic uh, energy than uh, sorry uh, with p3st uh, p61 solar cells now I'm wondering that if there's an alternate of P3HT, P3HT also, and if there is, we can have a good efficiency solar cell. Now, what I've found in the literature that PCD TVD is an excellent candidate for solar cells. <clears throat> Why? Because homolomo levels are very, you know, uh, they are favorable and they will give you when you when you study of energy band diagram you found that you'll get a good efficiency solar cell with pc pcd tvt it has uh, you know uh, and we can play with it so that we can tune the band gap also so i think we should replace pcd tvt with p3 ht and in the first go what i have seen that if i have made this pcd tvt pcbm this red color and this is black this black color is pc p3 ht and you can so see in the first go that the voc of p pcd tbt is more than that of p3 ht this simply means that we have an enhanced efficiency when we replace p3 ht with pcd tbt so what are the reason become behind this uh, enhanced uh, voc let's see this is the reason you have uh, I told I have already uh, told you the P3 P3 HT PCBM energy. This is the energy band diagram of P3 HT, and this is the energy band diagram of PCD TBT. You can see from here this gap, homolomo level gap. You can see from here this gap is more than that of this. So we expect more VOC in PCD TBT than P3 HT. So what we are expecting, we got it. PCD TBT has more VOC than this, and we are expecting higher efficiency with the help of PCD TBT than this. So we have done some thin film characterization also. This is uh, absorption spectra. But we have to do that to optimize this solar cell, we change the blend ratio. One is to one, one is to two, one is to three, one is to four, and one is to five. And you can see that as you increase the blend ratio, their absorption spectra increases, and hence we expect more efficiency. 
this is AFM. You can see from this is a very interesting thing. You can see from here that up to one is to four, the roughness increases, and after that, roughness decreases. Now, what are the what is the effect of this roughness? The increased surface roughness of the thin film facilitates the charge transport in polymer following junction and increases internal reflection in the active layer, thereby improving light collection efficiency. Also, increasing reference might increase the contact area between the active layers and the electrode, and hence it also increases the efficiency of the device. So there are positive aspect of increasing the reference, and the optimized reference is that one is to four blend ratio. So you can see from here what we have done. We have made solar cell with different different blend ratios. One is to one, two, three, four, and five. And you can see this is the efficiency plot. And you can see from here at the one is to four blend ratio that we got highest efficiency than other blend ratios. And you know the reason because absorption is more at one is to four and your roughness is more at one is to four. So uh, you know when you study thin films and you study solar cell and you can correlate the things with that. Now. We have used 20 mg per ml concentration. Now we want to optimize optimize this concentration also. For this, we have made solar cells with different different concentrations: 20 mg, 15 mg, 12 mg, 10 mg, and 7 mg, but with one is to four blend ratio. And what we have observed that we observed that at 12 mg per ml concentration, we get the highest efficiency than other device, than other concentration. So, what are our optimized beta parameters? 12 mg per ml and 1 is to 4 blend ratio. And there is a table for this. This table shows to us. Sorry, what is the time? I have 25 minutes. Okay, no problem. So this is this table shows that uh, all the photovoltaic parameters with respect to blend ratio, and you see that all the parameters are highest value on this blend ratio. So and 2 at 12 mg per ml. So this is our optimized values for PCD TBT organic solar cells. Now, what are the variation? Why there's a variation of VOC plant ratio? We have to, you know, uh, theoretically try to explain these variations. And you know, for this, uh, there's a dynasty of states and uh, uh, Gaussian the dynasty of state curves for that. And there are some conclusions that. And the variation of VOC in the blend ratio is, is related to the energetic disorder of electron density of states of donor acceptor materials. So now we have done some sort of aging studies. How, how the degradation of these devices happens? You can see from here, uh, we have uh, measured the current voltage characteristics from, from initial to 300 hours. And you can see that there's a degradation of the curves happening with the time and we have tried to un understand the degradation mechanism behind behind this so there's all aging uh, uh, photovoltaic parameters with aging you can see from here they are all degrading with time although there's a less degradation voc but all are degrading with time and these are the all the photovoltaic parameters with time aging time so they're all degrading now what to understand the degradation process to understand the degradation phenomena what we have to do we have to simulate this degradation phenomena we have to fit this uh, iv equation with some, some sort of modeling so we use two models here one is called drift diffusion model and second one is space charge limiting current model and what we have observed that there are some sort of equations so this is drift diffusion equation and this is space charge limiting current equation and using these two models, what we have observed that for, for PCT, uh, for P PCHT devices, the drift diffusion model alone is required to, 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 uh, to understand the, the current conduction phenomena in these devices. So these are the optimized parameters used in the modeling. And for PCT-TBT, again, 
we used to fit this uh, diff diffusion model and we observed that diff diffusion model alone is sufficient to understand the the current conduction phenomena in these devices so uh, freshly in for freshly prepared devices uh, whether it's p3 p3 hd or pcd tbt or any other material you can generalize it because we have um, done the modeling for two different materials so if you can generalize, generalize it for other materials also the diff diffusion model alone is sufficient to understand the conduction phenomena now what 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 about the degradation studies these are the, some parameters from from the modeling now you can see from here this this curve this fitting is for uh, this is uh, freshly prepared this is the graph of freshly prepared devices and uh, we are able to fit this freshly prepared curve with the help of diff diffusion model alone. So no need of other model. So current conduction is freshly prepared devices is governed by diff diffusion model only. Now, after five years, you can see from here, you cannot fit the graph only with the help of diff diffusion model. You have to take another model also. And this is space charge limiting current model. And you can see from here, there's a transition from Diff diffusion model to space charge limiting model after a particular voltage and after five hour and after 10 hour you can see that the area of space charge limiting current modeling is increased after 100 hour you can see again it is increased and after 50 150 hours so the degradation phenomena of organic solar cells can be understood with the help of two models one is called drift diffusion model and second one is called space charge limiting current model and the transition from you can see a transition voltage is there and the transition from drift diffusion to space charge limiting current model is called transition voltage and this transition voltage is very important because it depends upon the time of degradation so you can see from here different times of degradation you have a different transition voltage for that so now why it's degrading you can uh, because you know trap density you know de for deep with that with the degradation time the trap density is increasing and uh, we also calculate the trap concentration how much is the trap concern trap density of the the traps how much the how the trap density is increasing with time and uh, uh, with degradation time and how mobility of these traps decreases with time so we have also found with the help of modeling that how the uh, mobility of these traps decreasing and how trap density is increasing and this is the reason why, why you're you got less and less efficiency with that with, with increasing time so there are some conclusions now these are the some sort of uh, organic solar cells. Now uh, I have shifted from organic because in organic solar cell you have a lot of degradation, and you know that degradation is due to traps or uh, defects, with, with, which which uh, you know increases with the increase in time, and that defects are inherited in the material. So not outside the material, so inherited in the material, and you have to control these traps as much as you can, and there are different methods for that, but. You know, in parasitic solar cells, we have to take the advantages of both the material. Like uh, we have to take the advantages of some organic materials. And what are the advantages of organic materials? They are solution processable, very easy. You can process it in ambient atmosphere. They are very cheap. They are flexible. And but the problem is degradation. They are very much degraded. Uh, they are very you know degrades in in the environment very fast. So let's take the example of silicon silicon has all the disadvantages i have already told you in the starting of my lecture so we have to take all the advantages of organic and inorganic sources and that is called perovskite solar cells actually uh, what is a perovskite it's a calcium titanate oxide mineral catio3 structure and it was founded in 1839 by rose and uh, the general formula is abx3 and what is the structure this is uh, you can see this is a 3d structure of this is a 3d material and this is 3d structure abx3 structure here we have uh, the most two the two most popular organic materials are methyl aluminium lead iodide and formadinium lead iodide these two are the most popular perovskite materials 
which are which nowadays most of the scientists are using and researching on these two materials what are the advantages of perovskite materials on organic and inorganic materials high absorption coefficient the absorption coefficient is very high and uh, if absorption coefficients are very high you need less material for that and you will get high efficiency out of that low excitone binding energy you know i told you that excitone is a bounded electron hole pair and if the energy of binding is no you will easily dissociate it so it has low excitone uh, binding energy than organic and inorganic material high charge carrier mobility the charge carrier mobility is very high diffusion length is large so you can have you know uh, uh, large free to you have a, it, it can travel large distance without uh, recombination less material is required band gap can be tuned this is very important you can tune the band gap with the help of this abx3 structure i will show you how we tune the band gap and can be used in flexible devices it can be used in flexible because uh, it's a lightweight and flexible and uh, it's a flexible material so you can use a flexible devices so we can use in space also if you have it and you know uh, in the starting i told you that we have efficiency of 24 percent till date so we can use in, uh, in space also and in different applications of this now what we have done to change the band gap it's also because band gap is very important solar photovoltaic so this is the basic formula fa ma l i here methyl ammonium lead iodide we call it a mali and formidinium lead iodide we call it a phali and we mix this mali and phali we get this formula fa ma l i by changing the s we can change the band gap of this materials and if we change the band gap of this material we can you know tune we can play with the band cap and we play with the photovoltaic properties of this material and that is the beauty of this material but the problem is to synthesize this this material if you want to synthesize this material this material is also very you know it decreases in environment so that is also the reason that uh, if if we are able to make this material in ambient atmosphere and that too in powder form we can make a ton of tons of material and we can produce a tons of material we can use it anywhere we can send it we can we can uh, put it anywhere everywhere so i think the main goal uh, i actually i got a commonwealth fellowship to work uh, in uk uh, in university of sheffield and manchester to to uh, and my project is to make this material in ambient atmosphere and we are successful in making this material in ambient atmosphere. What we have done, and we have done some pellet formation of this also. You can see from here. <clears throat> I started with Mali, and I used ball milling technique, very simple techniques to form to, to synthesize nanomaterials. Ball milling technique, very cheap and very simple in the ambient atmosphere. And I am successful in making you know uh, this perovskite in a powder form. And then I put some formidinium in that, and using this formula FAMA LIE, I synthesize the range of material from Mali to Fali. You can see FA 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, and Fali. I am successful in making the whole range of material, and this whole range has different band gap and different photovoltaic properties. And I have since fabricated solar cells of full range. I will share my research in the later part of this presentation. <clears throat> so you can see uh, the perovskite is in a black phase. You know that is a crystalline perovskite, and these are the you know XRDs of crystalline. You can see from XRD uh, all the peaks are coincided. But for FA point eight and folly, you can see it's a it's it's a light it's a totally yellow it's a light yellow color. So and it's not crystalline it's not a perovskite phase these two are not perovskite phase so there are some additional peaks also so what i have i've done what i've done is that we have heated that material in a particular temperature for a particular time simple heating in an oven nothing else and i got all the perovskite phase for a whole range you can see from here all are crystalline this is the XRD of this, and this is the beauty. This is, you know, we are successful in making the whole range, and 
and we are successful in tuning the whole range from Mali to Fali. <clears throat> you can see from here the shift of peaks, very slight shift. It because of this FA uh, induction, and you can this is powder uh, fissum. You can see all are same, you know, nano uh, sizes material. <clears throat> I am also uh, synthesis, you know, make, made pallets of that for some sort of conductivity measurement uh, using impedance spectroscopy. These are some pallets, uh, SEM, FESEM, and you can see all the grains of sim similar sizes grains in all the materials. So, and I have uh, done some, uh, you know, uh, impedance, oh, sorry, <clears throat> absorption spectra and Calculate the band gap of these materials. You can see from here the band gap ranges from 1.5 to 1.4, and this is very close to the optimum band gap uh, for requirement for the solar cell materials. You can see from here, this table shows the whole range of band gaps. This is photoluminescence, and from this PL, I also calculated the band gap, and it's very coincident, uh, coincided with the band gap calculated by UV, UV measurement. So you can uh, this is a this is a support. This is another um, support to our UV measurement and the band gap calculations. And I have done some uh, conductivity measurement using impedance spectroscopy, and you can see from here there's some impedance spectroscopy, and you can see it's very interesting you know, to see that. This is a yellow phase which I am getting, and if I heated this yellow phase for a 150 degree for a particular time, I get a black phase, you know, black perovskite phase, and this is used in solar cells. But when I put this black phase for 30 days in open environment, it convert into light yellow. You know, this is not a pure perovskite. When you do XRD, you will get some other peaks also, but when I again heated it at 150 degree, again get a black face. And when I put it for 60 days, I get pure yellow face. This means that if you heat it, if you made a material in bulk form, no problem. In the starting, if you heat it, you will get a black face. But if you put it for some time and it converted into yellow phase or some impurities are there due to uh, changes of perovskite into non-perovskite phase, you'll he again heat it and you will get again perovskite phase. This is the best thing which I will get. So because in industry, you will need all these things. You will, you will buy material from the industry and you heat it. It's very simple heating. Nothing you required only oven for that. You heat it material for a particular time, you will get perovskite you use it for that and you put it and put the rest of the material in your oven or some somewhere and when you want to use it you heat it for one hour two hour you will get perovskite and you can use this is the stability in ambient conditions and we are successful in that now with uh, diazol uh, it's, it's industry in uk with diazol we uh, we fabricated some solar cells i'll show you the devices this is the device this is a large area solar cells we use in industry so industry requires large area solar cell. This is a solar cell which I have fabricated uh, with Dizol at the University of Manchester. And uh, this is the you know uh, block diagram of that, uh, structural diagram of that solar cell. We used glass, FTO, compact TiO2, then mesoporous, perovskite, the spiro for whole transport layer, and then gold. And uh, this is the batch of solar cell which I have fabricated in the UK. And there are some IV characteristics which I have found that, and you know, uh, you can see from here, this black is is the conventional techniques which most of the research, most of the groups in the world are using from directly social solution process solar cells. And this uh, yellow, you can see, sorry, red, this is the curve which uh, of solar cells, which I have fabricated with the help of that powder, which I have made. Okay, so you can see from here, same batch of solar cells, but with enhanced efficiency. So we can conclude that we have got more efficiency with the help of that powder instead of using conventional te techniques, which most of the people are using. So in that way, we can enhance the efficiency of the devices. You can see from here, this is another batch of devices. So we can 
these are the photovoltaic parameters uh, which we have found that and this is solution process which most of people are using and this is ball milled powder which i have made and you can see that all the photovoltaic parameters this voc is 0.9 to very close to ideal value so so and these are the, all the parameters which i have got and uh, when you compare with conventional techniques which most of people are using in the world we got higher efficiency with the help of powder which we have made so that is and we have done some aging techniques how the after one month you can see that it's very not very you know large increase decrease in efficiency it's a small increase in decrease in efficiency it's had more stability our devices have more stability than conventional devices that we can say that and uh, there are some conclusions and uh, what are the future scope now uh, you can also uh, now we have also we can also synthesize pure phase and stable materials with other cations and mix halide perovskite that what we can do and uh, with the help of with, uh, because now i am working on something else so young researchers can work on that this is another problem and now what uh, now i got fulbright fellowship for working on printing of perovskite solar cells because we have made uh, you know powder of that now if we use that powder in printing technology then you know it's a wonder we can have printing devices printing flexible devices with roll to roll manufacturing and they are very cheap in the world and i think that will revolutionize the solar cell industry thank you thank you very much for your patience and for hearing to me and uh, best of luck for everyone for their research Thank you very much. Thank you.